Hello and welcome to Gnostic Warrior Radio, broadcasting from GnosticWarrior.com in San Diego, California, to around the world. Today we have on the show Jordan Maxwell. He's one of the foremost scholars in the world on secret societies, astrotheology, and conspiracy theories. Uh, he's going to be a regular guest here on Gnostic Warrior Radio and podcast two times a month. So please stay tuned, and you can find more podcasts, again, at GnosticWarrior.com. Jordan Maxwell, you could find him on his website at JordanMaxwellShow.com. Again, that is JordanMaxwellShow.com. He's in Arizona right now, and it's great to have him again. How are you doing today, Jordan? How's Arizona treating you? Well, it's uh, beautiful here, but uh, <clears throat> it's about 7,000 foot up where I am, so it's, uh, it's a different kind of an environment for me, but uh, I've been here for about a week now. It's been a vacation, so it's very, very nice here, but I still want to go home, so because you know, I'm used to uh, California and I'm out of, I feel like a fish out of water right now, so... But, uh, but being here was what it was. It's, uh, it's a vacation for a week, so that was nice. But yeah, what, what's your your thoughts on that, Jordan? Because I'm kind of similar as far as when you know I go out of town. I, I enjoy it for maybe a few days, and a week I'm really pushing it, but actually like three days and I'm in pain, and I want to go back to my, my homestead. And then, of course, there's other people out there that love to travel and love doing that. What, what do you think it is? Do we just love to be in our own domicile with our own books and our own things? Is that so what it I, is? So, yeah, and, and I remember a long time ago on a, a National Geographic uh, program uh, about, uh, about fish, and, uh, and they talked about how fish have certain places that they go and they're, they're used to, and they're very uncomfortable in places they, they don't know. And, uh, and I, I think humans are like that too, animals, you know. Uh, uh, all living creatures have their comfort zone where they feel they want to be or need to be or, or the universe has put them. And uh, it's really something important to humans. You know, home is very important to people. And uh, you get to where you can operate in your own environment. You're used to it. You know it. You understand it. And then when you go someplace else, you know, and if you're going just for for the pleasure of traveling, that's fine. Go travel and, and enjoy yourself. But uh, but <clears throat> you know, if you want to accomplish anything, you have to settle somewhere and be in your own center. And so that's home. You know. So for me, <clears throat> I've traveled all around the world, but I'm very comfortable when I just go home. I can get more done there than I can anywhere else. So. Yeah, and I assume you you don't like crowds either. No. No, I don't. That's why I don't speak very much anymore in public. Or I, I, as much as I appreciate people, you know, coming to hear me, I don't really feel very. Uh, <clears throat> I don't feel very comfortable in front of an audience, because I don't think that much of myself to start with, and I and I don't see myself as that important to start with. And, uh, and and there's so many people. I guess the one thing that, that bothers me about being before an audience is that there are so many people out there in front of audiences that are worthless and useless, and they're just aggrandizing themselves. They're just promoting themselves, and they, they see themselves as so important. And so they're out there doing what they do uh, to promote their ideas and themselves and I don't want to look that way to anyone. I don't want to be just some talking head out there that's always on the podium, always out there on the on the on the stage, dancing around and and drawing attention to myself. I don't, you know, I don't feel very good about presenting myself to the world like that. I feel more like a Gandhi. I prefer to <laughs> stay quiet in my own little place and do something to help the human family but do it legitimately and do something of legitimate value. And, uh, you know, so 
I mean, I appreciate audiences and I appreciate the people, but I don't feel very comfortable speaking to yeah. audiences anymore. You know. Yeah, and when, when you talk about it, you know, that way, when I when I look at this this field and, and in any field, whether that be New Age or the Truth Circuit or whatever, it, it's almost like the they have to turn themselves into a consumer product and sell themselves out and market themselves to make money. And and the guys that are making money, of course, are the guys doing that, and the guys that aren't are guys like yourself. Yep. That's you know that they, you know, <laughs> that are living in one room with nothing. Yeah. You know. <laughs> and uh, you know, but I would prefer to live my way. And and, uh, and and fulfill my destiny in my mind, what I want to be and what I want to do, and uh, and it has nothing to do with being famous and uh, making money and and uh, celebrity. I, I don't care anything about that. I I was you know, pretty much uh, been in Hollywood for 53 years, so <clears throat> I, I I'm well aware of the entertainment industry. I know so many people in it. And I've been around it, and then when I, even when I first got here, back in 1959, I, I ended up having a job where I was uh, going around from studio to studio, meeting movie stars and, and delivering uh, clothes and products to the motion picture sets. And so I, I got to meet all kinds of very important movie stars and producers and directors as a kid, 19-year-old, 20-year-old kid running around to all the major studios, meeting all the most important people. I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I got, I could spend hours telling me about experiences I've had with all the major movie stars when I was a kid, delivering uh, stuff to them, picking uh, scripts up from uh, from producers and directors, and taking it over to actors' homes, and from there going back to the studio. So I mean, I, I'm well aware of the whole motion picture and entertainment industry, and. Um, it's fascinating, wonderful, and fascinating. But uh, I've been there and done that, and then you know, with my own work, I've been around the world doing what I do. So, I feel that right now, though, the most important thing for the human race is to have someone, whoever they are, to uh, to help guide the human family. Now, uh, entertainment is uh, enough of that is enough. We need yeah, to get well, back to you know to reality. I agree, Jordan. And and if you look at your work over the last 50 years and especially you know what I've seen myself in the last you know 20 years you know on the internet and you, you could witness that of what you've done and you know the the short you know one hour sessions we've been doing you know twice a month right now on on Gnostic Warrior the, these videos these radio shows have been getting over 5,000 views and, and listens so if you really look at that Jordan and this is just one little show and I know a lot of people are hungry for your information you're literally putting on arenas every week and you're doing it from your little one bedroom uh, apartment and I, I want people out there to understand exactly the the impact that he's making on probably you guys out there I know what he's made on me in my life the impact on me is is that you guys got to give to the man if you can you know and, and go to his website Jordan Maxwell show.com again that's jordan maxwell show.com and and give out of your heart you know what you can whether that be five twenty or a hundred dollars you know and if we all do that with people such as jordan i know everybody out there can't do that and again this isn't some kind of paid you know announcement to mo to jordan or anything like that this is out of my heart you know and you guys got to give back and whether that be, you know, articles, money, or your time, give back to Jordan, go to his website, and, and give him a donation, because he's, he's literally reaching thousands and thousands of people across the world, and um, he's living month to month, week to week, you know, and it's, it's not right. And I know it, it seems like you're paving the way to a future maybe where it, it's not going to be like that. And, you know, a lot of our shows, have, we've talked about religion and, and the state of, our world right now and where we're heading and it, it looks pretty scary with with what's going on what you know there's always been a secret hidden hand moving behind the scenes and I know we only could say so much you know on, on the air you know as far as secret societies go but you know we we live in America here and, and this is pretty much a Freemasonic built country our first president George Washington was a Freemason, mm -hmm. and then you hear of the Illuminati, and then you, you have the Jesuits, and then you have the, the Zionists, and you have all these different factions, 
And in, in reality, it seems like it's just one faction and they're all just kind of playing one another. What, what's your, your thoughts on, are we still a, a Masonic country? Are we, did the, the Catholics run it through the Jesuits? What's your thoughts, Jordan? Well, uh, I believe that, uh, that the founding of this country was supposed to be a continuation a revival, a reviving of Atlantis. From the uh, Masonic point of view, America was supposed to be, or the United States was supposed to be, the beginning of the revival of Atlantis to bring back a new golden age of profound wisdom, knowledge, understanding, freedom, and to uh, you know impact the whole world and, and to as uh, uh, as uh, one of the founding fathers, uh, Thomas Paine said we have an opportunity to reform the world. And so I think that's what was happening when they founded this country. They were thinking in terms of totally reforming civilization on the earth, period, with a whole new concept of freedom and, uh, and individuality where the individual was important and, and the, the uncommon man the, the, the scientist, the philosopher, the inventor, the uncommon man was to be promoted and it would become an uncommon civilization. It would be a civilization built up of, of brilliant people, inventors, the, the scientists. Uh, the whole renaissance of Europe was being replayed and rebuilt in America to be the new Atlantis, a new renaissance for the whole human race. And, uh, and of course, being humans, we all had, you know, they had plenty of problems and all kinds of, of uh, difficulties and criminality and all that, but the Founding Fathers saw that overall, at the end of the day, given hundreds of years, we might could build a whole new Earth with uh, you know, with mankind reaching for the stars and to, and so it was a wonderful idea. It was called the Renaissance, but uh, unhappily, the the political secret societies of Europe uh, decided that this was something that was absolutely intolerable. Will never work because uh, because for thousands and thousands of years. Mankind has never been free. There has never been a time on the earth when any civilization in any country in any era was ever free. We, the, the whole history of the human family on the earth from day one has been with kings and rulers and warlords and criminality, murder and violence and wars, one-upmanship and treason, all kinds of horrible things that the human race is, uh, you know, man's inhumanity demand. But with the coming of America, it was hoped that maybe we could start a whole new race of people on the earth where we would be free, we'd be protected in our, in our voice, we could voice our opinions and, uh, and be what you want to be and do what you want to do. And, uh, and, in, and in doing so, to engrandize the whole idea of the human race, you know, make us a better product on the earth. Well, unfortunately, though, the royalty of Europe saw all of this as not just a threat, but a deadly threat, because they, their whole history of royalty uh, has always been they were tyrants bloodletting, murderous tyrants. Uh, so that's what royalty is. I mean, you see the queen mom and the queen and Prince Charles, all that uh, royalty is, is gang wars. It's, it's uh, whoever's gang is the most violent and the most ruthless, they run the criminal syndicates. And unless maybe somebody new comes along who's even more violent and more corrupt, they overthrow that, you know, Al Capone gets thrown to jail and the bigger ones come in. And Just the bigger sword. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that's why, uh, unfortunately for the human race, the dark side always seems to, to come in and take whatever good that people may have had, certain people may have had, and come in and buy it up and, and rip it off and, and, you know, and completely redirect the, uh, the, the, the energies of the people so that today 
all of those great ideas are all pretty much gone. All that, the, yeah, you know, the ideas of a wonderful world where man will be free and and uh, and protected and our rights protected and and you know we would flourish as a as a human civilization. Well, all of that's pretty well gone. All we got now is just uh, FBI and CIA and and uh, government and the mafia and Cosa Nostra and uh, propaganda Dewey and the Vatican and Knights of Malta and the Knights of Templars and international banks and uh, so uh, you know that that's unfortunately it was a wonderful experiment but it didn't work. The people did not love freedom enough. The people did not love wisdom enough. The people generally speaking just did not love the truth enough to to defend it so now it's gone. Yeah, yeah Jordan and I, I want to talk about that because you know we, we could focus of course, on the the powers that be, you know, the, the the organizations that you mentioned, and of course, there's probably a thousand other ones of that are all working together. But is it the people really the ones that that give it up, and are they the ones that ask for this? You know, I heard a, a statement recently, and I forget where I read it, but basically, you know, our government government has to be as ruthless as the people, more ruthless than the people. It ha our governments are basically. Our, our societies are built for sinners as opposed to built for people such as you and myself who love truth and wisdom and, and, and good and ethics and morals. But our society, and, and I've been out there, Jordan, and I know you have, it's, it's not built like people like such as ourselves that are more upstanding. There's a lot of bad people out there that love this kind of thing and they want it. And, you know, they're, they watch the TV and they're blind and they don't see the chemtrails up, you know, the GMO foods. It's just, they're, they're just, love the society. You're right. And I totally, totally, totally agree with that. That's exactly right. Government has to be at least uh, a shade bit more ruthless than the people in order to keep some kind of semblance of order in the world. And so uh, it's uh, very interesting the way the human race has been developed in the past three to four hundred years. I mean, because with the coming of the Industrial Revolution, it was it was understood. I mean, before the Industrial Revolution, there was a lot of intellectual acumen uh, circulating, a lot of intellectual writings and people, deep thinkers. But with the coming of the Industrial Revolution, it was decided that what we need are workers. We don't need any smart people. We don't need all that crap about uh, uh, you know Greek philosophy and Roman theology and and the great thinkers of the world. We don't need any of those great thinkers anymore. We need people work at the plant. And so, uh, and, and so it was decided during the, uh, the Industrial Revolution in Europe, uh, don't bother to teach the children anything in school. Just show them how to do their job, teach them how to be in, uh, you know, uh, to get in line and get a job and work <clears throat> and build the bridges and build the high rises and build the the industrial military complex but we don't need any scientists we don't you know we got there's going to be a few of them anyway so but we generally on the earth all we need are workers period who people who just go to work and do what we tell them to do and so the idea of the uncommon man that was uh, being promoted during the renaissance where the you know where the Michelangelo's and the and the uh, make, uh, and all the great artists and great theor theoreticians and all the great minds, kind of the scientists coming out of the Renaissance, which gave birth to the idea of the United States of America and the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, uh, you know that was over. It was pretty well over with the coming of the Industrial Revolution. We don't care about all that freedom and liberty and justice and and honor and seeking wisdom and knowledge. Well, all you need to do is just go out and get a job and go work at the plant. You know, just go to work at Sears and be done with it. And so uh, we lost the great uh, momentum that the Renaissance had given us so that even how much we've lost, so that even today, if you are a Renaissance man, you're considered to be something to be feared. Uh, royalty fears the Renaissance man today. I mean, the, the governments of the world, including ours, is afraid of people who are intellectually and spiritually and in and, and, and every other way, you know, 
uh, thinkers and people who write and intellectuals and people who question scientists, etc. They're scared to death of that. They don't want you talking about educating people and going to school and learning how to read and questioning authority and question your government and question your religion. There's no room for that. Like George Carlin said, that's not what they want. <laughs> they want more that's for like, themselves and less for you. That's what they want. That's like why we're outcast in society and, and people such as yourself and myself don't make a whole lot of money because we don't conform right. to the, the system. That's right. that's so, I mean, that's just by default that works for them that way with, with money and control. Yeah. And um, why, why do they, they also allow it? It's like there's the veil there that you, you talk about the control, there's the education and everything else, you know, throw out the wisdom, let's not follow, the, you know, philosophy and all that and the, the ancient teachings, but they're still here and we could still talk about them. But, of course, we're not huge like some rock star, you know, we'd probably get, put out right away if millions of people were listening to the show. But um, why do they still allow it? Well, I don't think they can do anything about it. I think because <clears throat> the divine principle that created the human race from wherever it is that we have come from, there was a divine principle uh, mandated in the creation of man uh, that made mankind uh, and their very nature wanting to seek for knowledge and wisdom and understanding and the love of, of uh, you know, science and philosophy, etc., was uh, part of the nature of the human creature to want to educate itself and, and you know, and, and, and enjoy and blossom out into life and be who they are. And so it's been very difficult for all the warlords and the rapists and the murderers and the killers that we call government to keep control over the masses. Uh, because can you imagine what this earth would be like if it was <clears throat> the other way around, that the good and the intelligent and the wise and the perceptive and the inventors and the great theoreticians would be able to operate uh, freely without having to worry about going to prison and being thrown in a concentration camp, uh, and if the world was filled with the, with the Nikolai Teslas and the Royal Wrights and Albert Einstein and the great minds and the great inventors, my God, this, the world would be an incredible place of wisdom and knowledge and, and beauty, and etc. But no, unfortunately, uh, you were right, that, uh, and, and that's exactly correct when, when you say that uh, we get the kind of government we deserve because the government is big and what we are small. You know, like Dick Gregory said, you cheat on your income taxes, but they cheat on governments, you know. And, uh, and while, you're looking to, uh, uh, while you're looking to make out with some girl, they're looking to make out with the diamond mines in South Africa. And so, uh, you know, lust is lust, and, but they just have bigger toys. So uh, it's, it's all part of the human nature. There's a good part of us and there's a bad part of us. And that, that brings up a whole subject that I, I'm really interested in, is why is there such an, uh, uh, a difference in the human being? One half of us is good and the other half is bad. And, uh, and like the Apostle Paul said in the scriptures, that there's a war in our flesh in all humans. There's a war between good and evil. And that's the whole idea of the war between light and darkness, you know, between the sun and the moon, between light and darkness, between good and evil, between stupidity and brilliance and intelligence and wisdom as opposed to stupidity and ignorance. And, of course, the, the, power, the powers that be know this, and they, they play that against us by most of everything is for our flesh and for the dark side as opposed it. to the light. That's exactly right, mm -hmm. because they realize... And, they, they're, they're not, you know, they, the pe people who run this country and who actually run the world are a lot of things, but stupid is not one of them. They know how to play the human creature. They, they've got scientists who have been studying human nature and the human brain and the human nervous system. And, uh, and so they know how the human is created. They know what happens to it. They've got it all down to a science. They know exactly what you're going to be like if you're 18 as opposed to if you're seven, they know exactly how you're going to act, what your capacities are, and then when you get to be 50, they know exactly how you're going to think and what you're going to do, 
And so they've got the human race all nailed down. They know exactly how to play your number and, and make sure that you will stay within the confines of what they, your masters, want for you. And so, uh, uh, and so it never entered into the minds of the people. Uh, you don't need to crawl on your knees to these uh, masters. You know, but but unfortunately, the people love uh, they love to crawl on their knees to a tyrant. Uh, Ludwig von Mises, the great e uh, European economist, in his book, uh, in his four words, he said that the people of this world, in every age, in every country, uh, from from day one, have always and are now and always will support a dictator. They have always, are now, and always will support a dictator until the support of that dictator becomes more burdensome than his overthrow, which means that, and it's true, that people of all around the earth have always supported their kings and their rulers. Always. The people in America love to crawl on their knees to their president and the vice president and the congress and and the Senate, and that's very important and very regal, and it has to do with God and the and all and the great order of things. When actually the word Congress means sex, go look it up in our law dictionary. Look up the word Congress. Congress is a is a word that which means sex. And then when you understand that the uh, the 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 word senator, look what a uh, look what a senator is in the law dictionary. A senator was an actor in Rome. If you were an actor on the stage, you were called a senator. So they're just acting. That's why I like it. It's an act of Congress. Yeah, they're actors and senators and congressmen. Congress means uh, sex. And so uh, once you understand how our world is set up, it's set up on a very dark, occult, hidden, mystical system of words and terms, concepts and ideas, which have come out of the dark world of Babylon, Sumeria, Phoenicia, Cana, uh, out of the old Egyptian systems, all the dirty, filthy, uh, sexual uh, connotations to our laws, to our words. Now, when Christians go to church on Sunday and, uh, and, and see the, the doors of all churches are, are, are uh, pointed arches, the windows and churches are pointed arches, never realizing for a moment that the pointed arches of the doors of churches and windows of churches are the female vagina. That's what it is, the pointed arch. And, and inside, they have men uh, inside the woman, the man's inside the woman, so the man is wearing a, a, a robe, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a priest robe, the robe is a dress. It's a woman's dress. And so the man is inside of the woman's dress, and he goes into his mother, mother church, with the, with the pointed arch. And so the whole symbolism in a church is sexual symbolism. And this is why you have altar boys, boys that are put on the altar of sacrifice. They have altar boys. I mean, understand the way this stuff really works. It has to do, what we call Christianity, Judaism, and Islam have to do with the basics of how the human race came into being and how it works today. It's sex, drugs, and rock and roll, <laughs> money and corruption, but mostly sex. Islam, Judaism, and Christianity are based on sex. Well, and, and, if, and if you look at it, Jordan, the ancients knew a long time ago that to, to conquer the world, they, they would use the vagina and alcohol and drugs. It was pr pretty easy. And I think they discovered that, you know, because you'll, you'll see Bacchus is the god of wine, and then you have Isis, exactly you have the fertility right. cults, and I know there was prostitution pretty much in those, yeah, in those temple um, temples. Yeah, temple and, and, it, and I was thinking about it. Imagine, like, you're, you're a king, and you have all these hot women in this temple, and you invite all these dig foreign dignitaries, and you get them high, you know, drunk, and you have all these hot chicks, you know, screw them. You, you got them in your hand, basically. Done. Yeah, and, and they look up to you as God. They look up to you like you're God. Anything for you, because you're God. Rinse and repeat that same thing, and you got this world today. That's exactly right. 
and the people love it. You know, there's a scripture in the Bible, there's a, there's a story in the New Testament I consider to be the most important, one of the most important documents ever written for mankind is the New Testament story of Jesus. If you understand, it's a metaphor, it's a symbolic story, it has nothing to do with the, with the history at all. But if you understand it as a metaphor, it will blow your mind what's in the uh, New Testament story of Jesus. But there's a story in the Bible about Pontius Pilate uh, comes before the people of, of the city as the governor, and he comes before the people and he says, each year, uh, according to your custom, I can release one prisoner to you uh, uh, each year. So. Uh, this year I have two prisoners and I will release one of them to you. You tell me which one you want. Now on the left we have Barabbas. Barabbas is world famous for being a murderer, a pimp, you know, a criminal, and, and everybody knows Barabbas. He's a criminal. And on the other hand, we have on the other side a man named Jesus who is called the truth and the light. Jesus said, I am the truth and the light. So now I'm giving, Pontius Pilate says to the city, so here we have Barabbas, the criminal, and we have Jesus representing the truth and the light. Which one do you wish? Which one do you want? And the Bible says with one voice, the entire city said, give us Barabbas. That is a symbolic metaphor, which is, to, which is saying and telling you a profound truth about life. When the people of the nations and people of the city or the people of the state, the people of the country, when the people of the earth are, pre are presented with two kinds of leaders, here is a criminal, murdering, pimp, that is, uh, that is uh, everybody in the world knows he's a criminal, and then you have a man who represents the truth and the light. Well, the scripture says with one voice, the, the town said, give us Barabbas, which is telling you any time the world of mankind is presented with, with a criminal to run things or a good and decent man, they will always, always pick the criminal. Why? Because the criminal is like them. They're criminals. Mm -hmm. And since they're criminals, it's called democracy. They want someone to represent them in government and in religion that's like them. You know, it's, so uh, like it's, a demonocracy. <laughs> exactly. So they want and then somebody we... to represent them that's just like them. They don't want somebody who was, who was uh, w wise and intelligent and spiritually grounded and understands the, the, the world and understands what's good for the human race and how to protect the, the old and the, and the young and to protect people, people, generally speaking, are not interested in that. They want somebody like themselves, a good old boy who's just a rapist, a murderer, a killer, lion, thug, and they just love him. And he can say anything he wants and the people will support him and love him. But when they're faced with someone who's giving them the truth and the light, you know, they'll nail him to a cross. I'll let yeah, you I've had. I'll teach him to <laughs> try and educate and spiritually enlighten the human race. Kill him, or go out and arrest yeah, him and nail him to a cross. Yeah, and it's interesting. You know, Jesus represents the truth and the light, and we know he was crucified in Golgotha, mm -hmm. and that's the place of the skull. That's right. And and again, that's the New Testament. Another you know metaphor, allegorical. Basically, the truth and the light was crucified at that time and, and basically the, the light was put to the side and we have a government and a new contract which the New Testament, that's what it means, is this sixth age is ruled by Barabbas, that's right. basically, right? That's it. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. when you get things, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a whole world of occult knowledge that's been hidden from the people that uh, I talk with rabbis and the rabbinical authorities and Jesuit priests and theologians and I've been doing this for 53 years. And, and I am just amazed with, uh, with the stuff that's being accepted today in religion and where people have no idea where it comes from. A classic example is why do you have two testaments? You have the Old Testament and the New Testament. And when Moses is given the law, he's given two uh, tablets of stone. Why two? The two tablets of stone. 
well, uh, you know, this has to do with sex. It has to do with pornography and sex. But, but happily, people in churches don't know anything about that, and so they don't see anything wrong with it. But um, the, the two tone, first of all, you've got the uh, Old and New Testament. The word testament comes from testicle. That's where it comes from. Because in the ancient Egyptian uh, uh, system of things that the Jews have, have copied so much from the ancient Egyptians, in ancient Israel or in the uh, Israeli, even today, in the Jewish system, it's understood that if you one Jew brings another Jew to court, in a Jewish court, uh, if you are testifying against another Jew, you must hold your testicles in your hand when you testify because that's where it comes from, testicle, testify. And so you're under a test. So if you're going to testify, you hold your testicles. Because if we catch you lying against your Jewish brother in a court, you don't, you know, you, you get the idea of what's going to happen to you. <laughs> so that's why you hear call to testify. And so, uh, but how many... They just clean things up a little bit, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> And so, uh, and, the, and, and, and Moses uh, is given the two tablets of the Ten Commandments. And the Bible says it's written on uh, the, the two Ten Commandments, the two tablets. The Bible says, not in the movie, but the Bible says that Moses carried the two stones in his hand. And they were round. And they were written on a round stone, two round stones, the Bible says, and they were written on the front and back of the stones, and they and and that's where we got the ten the ten, uh, the ten commandments were two round stones that were carried in his hand, not big huge tablets of stone. No, the scripture itself says two round stones he carried in his hand. Well, anyone who has studied Jewish philosophy and and uh, and, and researched the words and terms. And the Old Testament know that stones is a, is a term used for testicles. They were called the male stones or male testicles. That's why the Ten Commandments are based on sex. It's the reproduction of life. It has to do with Moses carrying the two stones to testify. Uh, were they also the actual, the two testicles. I mean, uh, people need to wake <laughs> up and understand where this stuff actually comes from. Jordan, I want to ask, you know, when they tell these stories, is there also a real-life story that kind of coincides with it? Was there possibly a real Moses and there's a real, you know, no, Cushite so. wife? No, no. Okay. No, I, I'm totally convinced beyond a shot of a doubt for myself. I don't care about anybody else, but I've been looking at it for 53 years every day. And most people hearing me haven't looked at what I have been studying for 53 minutes. But I've been looking at it for 53 years, and I've talked to rabbis upon rabbis. I used to study. I used to go to the Simon Wiesenthal Center for Holocaust Studies and sit there for days and hours and hours, uh, going through all the records and talking with the rabbis. And, and it was an amazing uh, life of sitting and talking with brilliant people, Jewish rabbis, about the words, the terms, the symbols and where all this stuff comes from, and then you read in the Bible and in Genesis where Jacob uh, you know, fell asleep on a stone, and he, he laid his head on a stone, and he fell asleep, and then he had um, Judah. I can't remember if it was Judah. I think it was Judah. But anyway, the, the great prophet slept on the stone, and he had a dream in which he saw the, uh, a ladder going into heaven, so the next morning when he got up, he said, this, this stone which I have slept on represents our God. Our God is in this stone. And so then when you go back and look at, that, at the research on the, uh, what you call the Jewish Tograms, the old Hebrew reference works, it's called the Hebrew Tograms, you go back to all the Hebrew reference work and look up the stone that, uh, that he slept on, and it will tell you it was a phallic stone. And then it says in the Bible, in the morning, uh, he got up and said, this, this stone represents our God, the God of the Hebrews. And it said he took a, a thing of, of, uh, of oil and poured it on the stone to, uh, to anoint the stone with holy oil. Well, uh, anybody who's done any research at all on, on, on the ancient Hebrew religion realized 
that was a phallic stone. It was a penis stone, and he was lubricating the penis stone because that's where anointing comes from. So when you hear Christians talking about they are of the anointed, and Jesus was anointed. Anointed means getting laid, period. That's what anointing means. So that's why you, the king and the queens today, when they are anointed by Holy Spirit to become uh, and to become royalty, you know, when the queen, uh, when she becomes queen, she uh, has oil poured on our forehead, and we call that anointing the king or anointing the queen. Anointing means to lubricate the male phallic before sex. That's where it comes from. That's what we're talking about. But it's been it's been glossed over, misrepresented, um, and misapplied, and and put into a nice story and put into a story uh, to to teach people in the church that God's uh, son was Jesus was anointed, having no idea what the word anointing means, and circumcision and and uh, and uh, all of that stuff. How you know, if if God created a male, and created him perfect. Well, then why would you do corrective surgery on the penis at a baby? I mean, you need to look at this stuff. Penis worship and cutting the, the, the forehead, uh, cutting the foreskin off of a penis, what does that have to do with anything holy? It has to and these, do with these, sex, period. These That's phallic... what is religion, is sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and it's all based on astrology. And these, these phallic symbols, of course, the obelisk as well, why do we find those in, in Rome? Yeah. You know, you have the, the Ramses, the second, the obelisk of his there, and then we have the Cleopatra's needle in New York. That's right. Are these the, all the same people, basically, from Egypt or yeah. took it over at, or hybrid kind of thing? Yeah, and the Egyptian obelisk, which uh, the Washington Monument is an Egyptian obelisk. Uh, that's interesting, too, because there was supposedly seven major obelisks in Egypt, and there was a prophesied there would be an eighth in the world power. There would be an eighth, uh, an eighth obelisk, and so the eighth one is the Washington Monument. That's a whole different story about Masonic symbolism. But an obelisk represented a male erection, and so that's why you have the male obelisk or the Washington Monument looking directly straight down the, uh, the, the road from the oval office, the female ovaries. The female ovaries is where the male penis connects to, so that's why you have the Washington Monument and the oval office. The oval office is the oval of a female ovaries. And so again, our whole world system is based on religion, government and laws are all based on sex, drugs, and entertainment, religion, and all of the all of the degenerate stuff of the ancient world, the ancient pagan world, and we've never been able to extricate ourselves from that. We're still wallowing in sex and drugs and and uh, drive-by shootings and gang wars and all the filth and degeneracy of Rome. Uh, it's just an extraordinary story of the betrayal of the human race and. But unfortunately, as I've said in the past, people seem to love the dirty world. They're not interested in knowing the wisdom of the ancients and all the hidden wisdom that could guide the human race. And so they, what do you think about you know, the government? Do are there people out there? Is there a wise counsel possibly, or, or do you think that it, they're all psychopathic, or is there some type of wise counsel possibly leading this? where they're, they allow this to happen, and of course they might have, you know, there's two directions we're heading, which is total darkness and hell for the rest of our lives, or it's, maybe it's a mixed society where you, you still have this, you know, the murder, the rape, the, the sinner society, and then you have another society that's slowly being built. Do you see that being possible, or is it just one or the other? Well... You're asking me for a, a subjective opinion, and my opinion is that uh, no, I think it's uh, it's it's uh, one ball of wax. I don't think there's two. I don't think there's two. I think there's only one ball of wax. It's called the human race. Period. And so the whole entire human family on the earth. And we're not. Well, we're just the biggest of the biggest. But uh, but the whole earth is like us. We're all human. And so the entire human race is under a dark cloud. It's under a dark, demonic depravity of power, money, 
criminal criminality, mafia, um, you know, drugs, uh, and it's just out of control. It's totally out of control. And therefore, I, uh, it's my opinion that uh, unless and until there's an outside intervention in mankind's affairs, I see no hope for the human race because, generally speaking, the people who rise in power are the ones who love power. And one Jesuit priest said uh, the, when, when Richard Nixon was being kicked out of office, it was in the L.A. Times, an article where the Jesuit priest that was, was Nixon's friend, he said that, that uh, it was very, very difficult for a president to step down from office because uh, the, the, the rush, the, the, the mental, uh, spiritual rush that goes through your mind and through your body, being the President of the United States, being the most powerful and most respected and, and, and odd figure on the earth, with people falling all over themselves to get out of your way and to crawl on their knees to you, it's like sex. It is a, like a sexual experience, and so you, know, you, you don't want to break off a sexual experience in the middle of it, and so that's what it's like being a president. That's what it's like being a king. Prince Charles thinks of himself as God, and his mother thinks he's God, and to, for him to even perceive that he might not be God and have people crawl on their knees and, and cut their wrists and, and beg for forgiveness from him is inconceivable because he's like God. It's like a sexual experience. When actually you look at these people and they're nothing but criminals. They're all criminals and the royal family in, in, in England are all Germans. They're German criminals. They're not English. They're Germans. And they're criminals. But then again, all royalty on the earth are criminals. I mean, that's what, that's what royalty is. It's, it's people who see themselves as better than the masses and the when the unwashed masses and so they ride around in chariots while you trying to find a job. So I mean I, I'm just, I'm just very unhappy with the way the <laughs> human family has finally been taken over and uh, and most people are not interested in wisdom and knowledge and understanding. They say give us Barabbas, give us a, you know give us this uh, the fight scene. We we love going to Las Vegas and watch the fights. You know, we want to see cage fighting. We want to see some blood. We want to see uh, auto accidents and, and car races and <laughs> fist fights and, and getting fucked. I mean, that's what we want. We want Hollywood. You know, we want some action. That's why even on the news they call it action news. Channel 7 can we action can news. You know, we want to see some people get murdered. And sh <laughs> like George Sheldon says, I, I just can't wait for the news. I want to see who gets killed again and who's, who's doing who. <laughs> So I, I'm just very uh, disheartened by the fact that uh, the only light at the end of the tunnel is a train coming. Because unless and until people want spirituality, unless and until people want to know the truth and see where the world of mankind is going and want to do something to change it uh, and to put down the television and all the silly games and you know, parlor games, all the silly stuff, and theme parks, and put down all of that, and come back to the spiritual uh, destiny that we were supposed to have when we were created. And so that's why you people like you and I, we just do the best we can in trying to help our fellow man. Uh, for those people who want to know, I realize that most people hearing me have no idea what I'm talking about. But if you do want to know, and if you want to understand what the words mean, where the symbols come from, and all the hidden stuff of uh, in religion and government, well, that's been a, that's what I've been trying to do for all these years. Just explain to the people what you see is not what it is. You're, you're you're buying into something that you have not been told the whole truth. And uh, you know, I, I I agree, Jordan. We have just a, a few minutes left, and I want to close on advice for for the people out there because we we know what's going on we, we could do our research and and keep getting educated and of course a lot of the stuff that we look into you know whether it be ancient religion the meaning of words or stuff like that doesn't it pertains to what's going on now but there's a lot of things going on out there that are stressful and there seems to be an attack every which way 
on the human race, and I know you know that, and we've talked about that, Jordan. It, it seems like the best thing to do is, of course, get educated, but don't get bogged down by it and kind of flow with the system because there's there's no way to really fight it, and we know what happens to the people that fight that's it. That's right. That's right. Doctor, if you fight it, the system, you will be put in prison, and you will ultimately pay a horrible price for uh, for going against Tiberius Caesar, who has uh, declared himself God on the earth, and God will destroy you. And so if you want to uh, be like Jesus, or well, I'll nail you to a cross. If you want to be like one of the prophets of Israel, fine, and you will be beheaded like one. So if you want to you know, fight the system, uh, you know, then you're just wasting your time because they, they'll put you in prison and you will die in prison. So the smart thing to do, I think, is to quietly go into your home quietly and talk to the spirit. Uh, there is a divine presence of men called God in existence that hears you and talk to the spirit and ask the spirit to protect you and guide you and show you what you're to do and make sure that uh, the, you know, ask the Spirit to guide me and show me what I'm supposed to do and what I'm supposed to learn and I will do it and then uh, and then ask the Spirit show me a sign that you've heard me and watch what happens so when you talk audibly to the to the spirit world and ask it for, for guidance and protection and then ask it show me that you're hearing me you know don't be surprised if something happens because after all you did ask and so I'm totally convinced that there is a God there is a divine presence who watches over mankind but unfortunately like the history of the world I mean there's only a few good people left that are trying to help the human family and they are not you know they're not celebrated or promoted uh, only the uh, the criminals are promoted and they got the money not not the people who are trying to help but that's always been the, the, uh, the problem. Um, the poverty is the disease of a scholar. If you study your whole life, then you don't, you know, you, you're not going to have the money because you could either be wealthy and working every day or you could be studying every day and have nothing. So poverty has always been the disease of a scholar. I just do what I do because it's who I am. That's what I, you know, that's what I do. I don't, I don't know if it's going to have any effect on anyone I don't even care I'm not a celebrity I just do what I do because I love wisdom and knowledge and I want to try and help people to wake up and and, and, and you've done that Jordan and, and I appreciate your time again you know uh, these these talks have been great uh, you're going to be on Gnostic Warrior two times a month and it's great to have you it's like talking to a friend and and you could find Jordan Maxwell at jordanmaxwellshow.com Again, jordanmaxwellshow.com. Do not go to jordanmaxwell.com. That site has been ripped off from Jordan. He's talked about it several times. Do not go to that website, jordanmaxwell.com. jordanmaxwellshow.com is his website. He's been putting out a bi-weekly uh, podcast, sometimes every week. It's been great listening to him. And there's a place to donate. He has Amazon. Uh, a book club if you buy books through Jordan Jordan gets a little credit it's not big but if you're going to buy any books go through jordanmaxwellshow.com and also there's a PayPal I, I believe you have PayPal now that you could donate which is great and um, that's just awesome Jordan keep doing what you're doing I appreciate your time uh, have a safe trip home to Los Angeles yep and thank you and let's talk again we'll talk again next month okay Jordan take care bye 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 bye